regular basis. Last thing with social media is youtube.com slash Zach Foundation. There you can watch the live streams, and most important, you can watch the videos after their live stream. They're archived there. So if you have a great bit of information shared tonight, as I'm sure will happen, and you didn't quite get to write it, all of it down, that's a place to go back, rewatch something, but more importantly, share it, because that's a free, YouTube is free for everyone. So SAG After members and non-SAG After members can ask, access it, so we ask that you share that information out. There's over two and a half years of life raft panels alone on the YouTube page, so it's a great, great free resource. Free, free, free. Thank you, thank you. Um, last thing we want to say is everything at the SAG Foundation is free to SAG After members, but the only way it's free is through grants and donations. So we ask if you do have a moment where you can maybe give five bucks, we um, ask you, there's a donate page on the website, talk to myself afterwards. As the video said, we also do financial assistance, so if there's a time that you feel you're in need, it's a great um, time to call the office, go through that process, and also the money that you give goes back to maybe the person next to you to pay that phone bill to have another month of trying to get work. So with that, let's give our panelists a round of applause for being here and thanking them. We're going to start with Blair and they're going to introduce themselves. So Blair, you, you want to take it over? Uh, sure. Hi, uh, I'm Blair Hickey. Um, I got a theater degree uh, in college um, in studying mostly acting and playwriting, then went to New York to try and break in, did uh, off, off, way the hell off Broadway theater for a while. Uh, and um, got started, I helped uh, co-found a theater company with a woman, a brilliant woman actually, who is now the head of PR and marketing at the Guthrie uh, in Minneapolis. Uh, learned a ton from her uh, about the business uh, and about marketing. Um, started to work in TV, came to LA to pursue that a little bit more. And um, through a series of circumstances, um, getting canned by my agency is one of them. Uh, but uh, eventually, uh, it led to me developing with a business partner a uh, website casting about, um, which uh, has been an incredible journey for me and, and has taught me a lot. Um, over the last couple of years, we've grown and changed. And then, what, three years ago, I guess, we partnered with Breakdown Services. So I continue to act, but now I have an office at Breakdown Services. So I've been able to sort of peek behind the curtain a little bit and talk to casting directors and understand a little bit more about how the process works, uh, which has helped my journey and um, taught me a lot about the business and about that relationship between actors and casting directors. Patrick, you want a little bit about yourself? Uh, good evening. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Patrick Stack. Like Blair? Blair. Yes. Blair. Blair. Right, Blair. Uh, I attempted college. I went to two colleges uh, to try to get theater degrees. Um, came up bupkis, but that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, I had some fun. Uh, I started out in New York and um, was fortunate enough to, uh, well, I was an actor, was fortunate enough to get into a show uh, with Nathan Lane. And he and I became friends and we uh, developed a comedy team, Stack and Lane. I got that top billing. I don't know what's happened to Nathan Lane. Anybody know? <laughs> huh? Okay. So we did that for about five or six years, and I came out here in 1980. We came out here together and did the back and forth stuff, and of course we were here for pilot season, that fabulous, fabulous pilot season, and eventually we went our separate ways. And I had some nice years as an actor, and some struggling years as an actor, and wanted to have a family. So I decided I was gonna give uh, acting a little bit of a break, and I got into ad sales. I got very lucky, and a friend of mine got me a job selling advertising space for Advertising Age magazine. And with a little bit more luck, I migrated into the internet space very early on and actually sold the first ads on Yahoo in 1995. I'll tell you what, when they asked me to come and interview, I thought it was the chocolate drink. <laughs> uh, I was surprised. Anyway, that was a very nice run, and like a lot of folks at that time, it was, it was a good place to be. And I decided I really wanted to be back in entertainment. Um, so I decided I was going to be a producer. And I hung out a shingle. I got an office at Culver Studios and then S Sony. And I thought, well, let's see. I, I know a lot of actors. And if I don't know actors, I can get to actors. So that's good. Uh, I know material. I've written screenplays. And that's what a producer does. That's good. And I've had some pretty good success raising money. So I should have no problem being a producer. Uh, I've had <laughs> some moderate success. Interesting, interesting business. They're all, all these different levels are, are interesting. But uh, the thing I'm most passionate about now, I, I will say that, sure, I'm open for some acting jobs as well, but they've been uh, few and far between because I now refuse to audition, so, which is an interesting concept. Um, 
we could talk about that later. However, I got into ad sales and the light bulb went off for me. And I realized, oh man, this is crazy. This is, this is selling, well, this is kind of what I'm doing as an actor or tried to do as an actor. And again, this epiphany that we are all in sales. And I said, you know, someday I'm gonna write a book for actors and writers and those folks in the creative space who don't know they're in sales. And I speak from my own experience. I didn't realize that. I thought you know, I had more hair and okay, I should work. Uh, that wasn't the case. So I have started um, <clears throat> last year and in the process of finishing up this book and starting a workshop specifically for creative folks and to talk about the selling process, to treat the, your career more like a sales and marketing person would rather than an artist. So that's what I'm doing now. Thank you, Lance. Hi, I'm Lance Still, I'm Executive Vice President of Integrated Marketing and Promotions for the Weinstein Company. And I'm the odd man out because I have no acting experience, um, various, and I have a degree in molecular biology, which totally paid off for my current job in marketing. You'll have a series with Fox. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, you know, what I do every day is basically what Patrick was talking about, is I'm out there making cold calls, asking people for a lot of money, and they're not doing it necessarily because they're convinced about the property or the brand that we're presenting to them. They're doing it because they trust us, mm -hmm. and we've created a personal relationship with them, and how do we do that? How do we do that in 30 seconds on the phone? You know, and so when I was invited by Dennis to come here, we really started on, you know, talking about the parity between the creative industry and having to market yourself. And, the Weinstein Company is really unusual in that we don't have the budgets like a Warner Brothers or a Sony or a Fox. We, we have little tiny budgets and we're a cheap company by nature. And so, and so cheap equals tactical, you know, and, and the way that we, if you look at traditional models of luxury marketing, like an Hermes or a Louis Vuitton or, um, you know, a Dolce & Gabbana, they're not spending necessarily when they first launch, they're not spending big media budgets. They'll start with a small buzz with influencers. And then they go out to people who, you know, the influencers, are listened to by the early adapters, and you start seeing the tip of the pyramid, and then that eventually winnows out to the mass market. And so that's how a typical luxury brand markets itself, and that's how the Weinstein Company does as well. You know, if you look at our um, small releases, like the artist, Silver Linings Playbook, Django, we start in a few theaters, and then we sort of fan out to the rest of the country. And that's because it's a tactical way to use our dollars to get the attention of the influencers first and then go to the early adapters. And I think that there's so, much, so many things in common with what you guys need to do to be successful in the industry and to get attention without you know, having to spend a lot of money. So that's why I'm here, and thank you for having me. Dallas? Hi, uh, I'm Dallas Travers. I am also the odd man out because I am not an actor. <laughs> Go girls, right? Um, I'm really, I want to start by just saying how grateful I am to be here and by really acknowledging everybody in the room and everyone watching the stream because it is December 18th and that is an easy time of year to completely check out on yourself. So the fact that you're here today, I just really want to honor that. And, and acknowledge you for your commitment to your own growth and your career. It's inspiring to see. So I am a business coach for actors, and I give actors the marketing and mindset strategies they need to find next level work with or without representation. So my philosophy is that as soon as you stop chasing auditions and start building relationships, you will experience a paradigm shift. And that's going to show up in the results that you generate as well as the way you feel about yourself in your pursuit. So um, I do have a book, it's called The Tao of Show Business, How to Pursue Your Dream Without Losing Your Mind. Highly recommend it. Thank you. And it's, and for me, I just, um, coming from an entrepreneurial background, the thing I get most excited about is taking an entrepreneurial strategy and spinning it around just enough so that it applies to the life and times of the actor. So I think we're in for a good panel tonight because you're gonna get some out of the box strategies for sure. Let's give him a hand, another hand for a thank you. 
So we kind of tricked you by labeling this um, panel prepping for pilot season, because as many of you know, if you've been around long enough, pilot season kind of has been turned on its head, and it's not that January through March as much anymore. But more importantly, if you were here la last night with the acting um, coaches and teachers, we said it there as well, that the information we're going to talk about tonight really applies year round. And if you do it year round, then it's not so much about one season or one couple of months. It's about a lifetime of a career. Um, to give you guys a little context, one of the acting teachers said last night that an acting career is a 60-year career, and it's not just one month or two years or a, a pilot season. So a lot of the conversation is, is through that mindset. So to give you guys context, to let you know where we're going, we're going to talk a little theory, a lot of business, and then we'll get into specifics down the road about exactly about things like mailings and conversations with casting directors and so on and so forth, just to give you a trajectory. So actually, I'm going to start with Lance, because I convinced Lance to be on this panel specifically around this kind of conversation of how can we learn from people that are not in the acting business, from the CEOs, from the entrepreneurs out there, because that's really what we all are. We're our own business um, owners and we're own, our own entrepreneurs. So Lance, can you maybe talk about in your experience what you've learned from the CEOs and entrepreneurs that you've worked with that are skills that you maybe take on for yourself, but then are skills that maybe other people should think about when starting their own business or running their own business? I think, uh, you know, something we've learned is just not taking no for an answer and, you know, it's a little bit different in trying to sell a property or something like that and selling yourself and it can be really hard and I've actually personally taken my approach with pitching people to my approach with negotiating my salary because I realized that I wasn't, give, you know, I was treating myself like a bum, you know, and just like, all right, I'll take that and sign it. And, you know, not taking no for an answer, but also not taking it personally. It's just business, you know, so don't let a no hurt your feelings. Just analyze, like, where is that coming from? Why is that? You know, and you just have to be a little bit indefatigable, you know, unfortunately, in, in this industry, in this industry. And, you know, other things that I've learned is to come in fully informed. If you're calling somebody, do a Google search on them. Find out about them. Try to figure out what some phrases, some commonality that you have. So in the first few seconds of the call, you know, you can maybe say something that will get their attention and you won't just be another tiresome phone call. Be nice to assistants. You know, that's really important. If you get somebody on the line and you're talking to the assistant, and ch how's your day going, you know, be because they probably aren't having a great day or they might be having a day a lot like yours. And so remember to be kind and be kind to the people who can help you later. And once you get in the door, you know, it's always helpful to continue to be nice to those people. So I, I think, you know, above and beyond anything else, it's, it's not taking it personally and being more analytical about it because no, the first time, second time, third time, it's exhausting and it's really hurtful. And you need to elevate yourself above that and be analytical of where the no is coming from, what you're doing, what's your approach, change your approach, change the message, change how you're branding yourself and do your research before you make those calls and those approaches. Any, any other ideas with that? Well, actually, Lance, I love what you're saying because um, what you're speaking to, whether you're on the phone with somebody or calling them the second or third time or being nice to an assistant, is exactly that about building a relationship. Mm -hmm. And you know, with, that translates no matter what business you're doing. And one of the things I've, I've learned working with Breakdowns, Breakdowns is known for you know, Actors Access or the, and, and the Breakdown system, which is about submissions, which is it's a sales process. You are selling yourself mm -hmm. for doctor number two, whatever the role is. And it's a very fast, immediate process. Marketing, which I think is the other side of the coin, is a much longer process. It's, it's about building relationships over time so that you can make a sale when it comes time to make the sale. Because it's much easier to make a sale with somebody that you know versus with a stranger. So that long-term approach about building relationships and, and getting to know somebody and realizing that it's I think it's easy for actors to take it personal, like you said, because they forget that it's a two-way street. Actors tend to think about marketing as read my postcard, come to my show, give me an audition, uh, bring me in, give me a job. And, and, and it's very me-oriented. When you flip that around and you realize marketing is a two-way street, then you start to realize that it's, it's not just as an actor, that we're, we're more than that, we're storytellers. We're storytellers in a town of freelance storytellers. And our job is to, our day job is to spend the time finding the people in town who tell the same story we do so that we can work together. And that could be a casting director, a director, a producer, a writer, whoever it may be. So finding those people and building relationships, now it's not so much personal, oh, I got rejected. Mm -hmm. Now it's more business. Hey, I tell a story. Do you tell the same story? Can we help each other? Mm -hmm. 
And if you can, then you invest the time to build that relationship. And, and don't take no because you have something to give them that is of value. You have a story to give. I think, I think you just hit on the key because I tend to sort of break things down just a, a, a little bit more. To me, if we all agree that we are all in sales, we just happen to be selling a different product. It could be ashtrays, it could be condos. In this particular case, it's performance and art. And not to be cynical, but that's the reality. And Sales 101 is you are fulfilling a need for somebody else. It's not the other way around. I give you what you want, I'm gonna get what I want. And that is the nature of sales. So uh, I think it seems easier to sell to a friend, but I think ultimately, if you have the product that they need and you're going to fulfill that need, it, it, it really doesn't matter. So the big trick is building that relationship, getting the opportunity to sort of be in the room and present your um, solution to their need. So, um, but I think it really, it, it's about selling. The marketing to me is the career element. You know, many, many jobs make up a career. But ultimately, every day you go out, it's a sales call. And it's not glamorous. You know, we all wanted to be Willie Loman, play Willie Loman, not be Willie Loman. <laughs> uh, but that's the reality. And we carry a bag, and we have a product, and we need to go find those people that want to buy our product because it fulfills their need. So, you know, sometimes not taking no for an answer. Yeah, but ultimately, you, you got to have what they what they want. And again, not to take it personally is is spot on because it's just it's just too easy. Look, we got in this business for a reason. We all have healthy egos. Uh, but that needs to be managed because you cannot take it personally. So. Can I offer something? I don't know about you guys, but I feel like I'm allergic to selling. Like that word makes me itchy, sales. And I agree with everything that you're saying that really we are all in sales. But for heart-centered storytellers, sometimes you need to just change your mind about what sales means. So for me, what really helped was redefining the idea of marketing. So I never sell anything. And people, people pay money to me to, to take my classes, but I'm never selling classes. Instead, I'm presenting an invitation. So I look at sales as an invitation. I'm sharing an opportunity and giving you the chance to decide yes or no. So think about this in the context of being invited to parties. So I'll speak for myself. I can be a little bit of a wallflower. So if I'm invited to a party and I don't know anyone at the party, the likelihood of me going is super slim. If my best friend is hosting a party and I'm invited, I'm totally showing up. So now your job is to cultivate relationships and present an invitation. The invitation, of course, is fulfilling the need, but that mindset shift, just changing the language, for me was super helpful because most artists, you don't like selling, right? Especially if what you're selling is you because now that kind of feels like whoring yourself out and that's not something that you wanna do. So think of it as, Think of, maybe it is, but <laughs> that's a different panel. <laughs> yes. Think of it as extending an invitation. Well, there, there's a fundamental shift that happened in my career when I started to think about things differently along these terms. Because when I broke it down, you can call it whatever you want, but when I broke it down into these sort of two arenas of sales and marketing, you know, one is signing the contract and, and getting the job, making the money, and one is building relationships and letting people know this is the story that I tell, and you tell a similar story, maybe we can work together. They're, they're being able to offer that, it did actually, it changed what I do in the room, because you know, I've got what I call personally like good student disease, right? Like I just, I wanna please the teacher. Uh, and that's a tough way to be in an audition room because every audition is about pleasing some stranger you don't know much about. And just, dear God, if they like me, this mystical gatekeeper person is gonna turn the golden key and I'm gonna get a job. And that's just a hard way to live your life. When I realized that, no, it was about offering my story and marketing myself, saying this is a story I tell, and maybe we can work together. Maybe not this job, but because there's a lot of factors I can't control, maybe the one down the road. What changed in the room for me, instead of walking into this proving ground where it was a test and I had to get it right, and oh God, I hope I did it right, it became much more of, hey, thank you so much for this opportunity. Let me show you what I have. Here's my story. Boom. Hope you can use it. And if not, this time, I get it. There's a lot of factors, but you and I kind of tell the same story, so I'm not going anywhere, neither are you, we'll work together down the road. Which in and itself is a marketing opportunity. That's face-to-face -face marketing, which is now every audition for me. It's not about I have to get this. You know, it's about, uh, I love the old adage, don't worry about booking the job because you can't control it. Book the room, make a fan out of the room. That's marketing. Make, make them understand who you are and what story you tell. So they say, ooh, 
I wish I could use that story right now. And I can't, so let's find another opportunity to use that story later. Great, um, we're gonna um, throw this to Patrick and then obviously anyone else that wants to answer. How, um, what people have you read, what um, business people or books that are maybe outside of the acting realm that have been beneficial to you to shape kind of your mindset of how you see things in, in the way of sales and marketing and invitations and the terminology that we've been using? As hokey as it sounds, Zig Ziglar. I mean, I love his affirmations. I, I, I think they're great. And um, I mean, by, uh, by uh, at, uh, what was it? Attitude, not aptitude, determines altitude. So, I mean, <laughs> those are the things that stick with me. Um, yeah, I've, I've gone to some um, self-help seminars. Stephen Covey, uh, those types of, of books are great. I, I tell you, I, I think if you can pick up a gem or two along the way and you keep collecting those and you get to put them in your toolbox, that's the way to sort of approach it. Um, so I've, I've collected lots of little, little things along the way from people. But um, what I realize now is uh, a lot of my own experience, having been on that side of the desk auditioning and then being sort of in rooms and selling a lot of stuff that I didn't have much of a personal connection with, but that was my job to sell. And then as a producer, being on this side of the desk where I'm actually you know, sitting there hiring with the casting director. And, and it's, just, it's just been an enormous, um, uh, tremendously mind-opening experience to sort of see how this whole process works. So are, are there specific uh, titans of industry that, that I admire? N I, not particularly, not, not really, um, because I don't think it necessarily takes those people. We, we come in contact with so many different people that do things well, and that could be the barista. And you sort of, hmm, okay, yeah, I, kinda like, I like that presentation. I like, like how that, that came across. And you know, file that away. What's something that that person did that you admired? So I think it's such a challenge, this business, and, and so many levels. So again, if there are people that you respond to and or you've seen interviewed on CNN or wherever it is, you know, if you get a little gem, file it away. And if you can use it, great. But I mean, there, there's so many how-to books out there, although I'm going to read the best one ever. <laughs> Um, but I think that's what you need to do. Otherwise, you get a little overwhelmed. But I hope I didn't sound evasive. No, 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 not at all. Is there anybody else? Uh, I'd love to respond to that. Yeah. Um, I think it would be really genius for all of you to start following a handful of internet marketers. So internet mark, like it's this whole weird industry, internet marketing, right? And what they've been able to do is create million dollar businesses and they're their own brand. A lot of them are like self-help coaches, right? But they've been able to leverage free online marketing in order to build a massive empire for themselves. So let me just throw a few names out and you can get on their email marketing lists, right? And so you're gonna get on their lists and be careful because they're good salespeople, okay? So be mindful of that. But get on their lists and start to model what they're doing. Model what they're doing because they spend a lot of time and money split testing, really trial and error to figure out what works. So now you can just model and, to, and apply it to your own career. So um, there's a guy named James Wedmore who does some really brilliant video marketing. So any of you creating content uh, for YouTube, he's definitely someone to follow. I think that Lewis Howe is doing really good work. His, Website is linkedinfluence.com. Linkedinfluence.com. Mm -hmm. He's a LinkedIn expert. There's also a woman named Marie Forleo who has just built an extraordinary business um, mentoring entrepreneurs, and her marketing is so smart. Um, who else can I share with you to kind of round it out? And Deepak Chopra, actually. Have all of you heard, like, he's been doing these meditations, right? And they're free. And I'm like, what's he, like, what's his plan, right? So start to really pay attention to online marketers because they're going to model for you free strategies that you can apply to your career. Can I ask you a question then? Yeah. Because you're obviously very familiar. Mm -hmm. What is one strategy that you've admired that these folks could um, adopt? Great question. Lead capture on your website. All right. So 
what is lead capture? Oh, I'm about to blow your minds. Okay, so when you visit, a, you, you can see an example of this actually on my website, dallastravers.com. And when you visit dallastravers.com, you're gonna see a smiling Dallas at the top of the website offering you a giveaway. And there's a couple of them. It's like video training or like my favorite resources in exchange for your email address. All right, so research shows that when we visit a website, we're gonna decide whether to stay or go after three seconds. So in three seconds, someone that you meet at a networking event who goes home to Google you and goes to your website or has your business card and goes to your website, or someone who heard of you, or maybe you had an audition and the story didn't match, but the impression was there. If they go to your website, you have three seconds to find out who they are and stay in touch with them. So lead capture on your website and then stay in touch with the people who are opting in to your list by adding value. And that's through email marketing and you'll see examples of that in action with all of the people that I just listed for you. But that one strategy in my business has made the, the biggest difference. And also, um, I'll just share a quick story. A student of mine, her name is Tara. And this year, she booked the lead in a film that was like her dream role. She got paid. I think she ended up getting paid eight grand to shoot the movie, which for her was a huge paycheck. And like all of the stars aligned. And it was someone who had never met her in person, but who had been receiving her email newsletter once a month for two and a half years. And he began to really feel like he knew her, he trusted her, and, and she had really built rapport with him. So she didn't even audition for the job. It was an offer. So this is what's possible when you start to think like a marketer and a business person rather than doing the same old things that everyone teaches you, which is mailing your postcards, but only when you've booked something. So now no one's hearing from you, which is really hard to book something, so you're never mailing postcards, and it's this, uh, uh, right? It's this cycle that never ends. Could I drop in just another little quick yeah. anecdote about, about marketing? Yeah. And it's a little bit more instant in this world where, I mean, Twitter and we know what's happening around the world instantly. But uh, this was an experience of, of just positive, good, smart networking and marketing uh, on my brother's part. My brother, uh, his name is Tim Stack, and he's had a really nice, nice, successful career. Um, he's had a couple of shows that, that he's executive produced and was showrunner and star of, and now he writes on uh, Raising Hope, and before that, My Name is Earl, and he's just had a really good, strong career because of his ability to know how to network, how to manage relationships. And a very quick story, he um, was living with me in New York and a friend of mine who uh, worked for a small uh, mid-level voiceover agency in New York needed a bartender for a Christmas party. And I said, oh, Tim will do it. Tim took the train up, uh, did, the, did the bar. Uh, one of the clients there got completely hammered and Don Buckwald, who owned the agency, asked if Tim would mind driving um, this actor back to Manhattan, and Tim said, of course. Tim was smart enough to not hit Don up with lots of pictures and resumes and all this. What he did was just manage the relationship by sending letters every now and then, keeping in touch. I'm doing this and what, and Don encouraged that. Yeah, just sort of keep in, in touch. Fast forward, of course, Don Buckwald's biggest agent is Howard Stern. Howard Stern let it be known that he wanted to get into television. Tim had an idea of marrying Baywatch with Get Smart, which was the show that it eventually became Son of the Beach. Well, he had this relationship with Don and said, Don, I'd like to come in and tell you about this. Absolutely, Tim. And he ended up selling it in the room. Uh, ran for three years and did quite well. The point to that is we're so uh, geared to get this instant, instant feedback and, 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 and get this job automatically. But this thing, this relationship was, I don't know, 20 years in the making. And so, uh, I think that's important as well. Again, what, what you mentioned earlier, a career is a long, long time. Lots of jobs, but the career lasts for a long time. So, anyway. My husband actually did the marketing on uh, Sun of the Beach. No and kidding. He was a huge fan of Tim's. He said he was like really wonderful to work with. So. I've got Tim around the corner. Tim, come on out. <laughs> He said he was, you know, and clearly his, uh, his ability to build relationships and yes. continue that story mm -hmm. was there even with the marketing guy at the network. You know, mm -hmm. he was really responsive and always, you know, because that can be, getting the marketing elements can be really painful for the mm -hmm. poor suits behind the camera who are trying to get it done to help promote your show. And Tim was such a consummate
private professionals. So, um, and on the reading side, I just, I have a whole, you know, it's, it's funny to me that, you know, I'm in marketing and I'm going to say something completely removed from, my dad came to this country um, in the 50s and he was actually a follower of Vivekananda, who is mm -hmm. one of the first guys to bring yoga to this country and, and he had his own yoga institute. And I found a lot of useful information and help in life and in work by reading, you know, Vivekananda, by reading my dad's works, by reading the Dalai Lama, by reading Mandela, you know, and just some, some of the things, because it's the story of the two-way street that you were talking about and taking yourself out of yourself for a little bit, you know, being self-critical, but in a loving way. How am I representing myself? How does this postcard look? If I were to get this postcard, how would I feel about it? If someone doesn't respond to me, is it because they hate me? No, it's because Lord knows what happened. They could be going through a divorce. They could, you know, have a flat tire. You know, there's something terrible. They could just be very busy and overwhelmed. So, you know, I find that reading these books that are outside of the marketing world also expands my way of thinking when I'm approaching work because then it isn't the cookie cutter what they've heard a thousand times from everyone else. When, when I make a pitch, it's, it could be weird, but it's going to be different from what everyone else is, is putting in front of them. And, you know, to your point about sales is really fulfilling a need, sometimes people don't know what they need. And so it, it's being able to sort of vibe them in a way that you can understand something that they're not articulating. And again, I think being able to take yourself out of, you know, the typical, um, in, you know, taking yourself out of yourself, basically, and, and just really trying to step into that other person's place. And so some of these other readings are really helpful. It's I, I would say read everything, um, <laughs> everything, because part of what we're doing is, if, if, as a storyteller, if we are presenting ourselves as, here's how I can help you, here's how I would tell your story, here's how, here's how I bring my story to your script, figuring out what story you tell is a, is a complex, long thing. It's not as you know, simple as uh, you know, branding yourself with a profession or with a certain just type. I think it, it goes deeper than that. And I mean, we could spend hours, I think, talking about the process to find out what story I think you tell best. I think we all have a story or two maybe that's in our DNA that we were sort of born to tell, and we can bring that to multiple situations. And my advice for folks asking me about how do you find that it's, uh, first of all, it never ends. I think it's a lifelong process that goes on because it'll change, but pay attention, not just, you know, how do you look on your headshot? That's kind of the traditional actor thing. You know, here's my look, my professional look, and my dad look, and that's what I tell. Go deeper than that. Pay attention. What books do you read? What books do you respond to? What movies make you cry? What song gets stuck in your head that you can't get rid of? What poem do you remember from when you were a kid? What plays do you go see? All of this is going to start to speak to some story inside of you, which you may not even be aware of. And, and I think if you spend enough time reading and what's on your bedside table, uh, what do you respond to? Uh, and it goes all the way to, you know, when you're in class, somebody hands you a script and say, let's work on this scene. Sometimes, you know, how sometimes you, you, you get the scene and you, just, you read it once and you just got it. it. You absorb it, it's in you, and you just, you, I want to tell this story. Why? Why that story? How does that relate to what you read last week or read this weekend? Other times you get a script and it just, I, it, maybe it like, you know, okay, so there's like a lawyer dude, like I should be able to do this, but it just, it's like a clothes that don't fit right, you know? And there's something about that story that, that, that isn't quite what you do or what you do naturally. So, you know, I would advise read everything, read everything you can and expand your horizons that way and then specifically within our industry don't just stop with acting because you know again it's all me 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 and we tend to get blinders on but expand that look at what other storytellers are doing um my recommendation for what it's worth i think there's a brilliant podcast um called script notes um craig mazin and john august are two screenwriters a-list screenwriters um you should probably know who these guys are they're, they're they're pretty great and once every tuesday they put an hour-long podcast it's free you can find it on itunes and and they talk about screenwriting and things that are interesting to screenwriters, but I hear things inter interesting to storytellers. And so uh, they talk about marketing. They talk about marketing from a writer's point of view, and I hear some of the exact same stuff that we talk about, about building relationships over time and not worrying about the immediate sale, uh, about writing a script that somebody likes but doesn't buy and 10 years from now remembers you and asks you to write something else. Um, so they talk about peer-to-peer, storyteller-to-storyteller, working in this town. I think they have some brilliant advice that you can kind of extrapolate into your own career. Um, 
Uh, but get your hand on as much as you can because uh, finding out what we do and how, what we can offer this town is kind of what I consider our day job. That's what we should be doing. That's great. Howard Fine's um, his last point last night was actors don't read enough. And I think that's perfect of what you said. I want to, um, little big picture thinking before we get into the details, one more thing, this idea of authentic interaction and authentic relationships, which you guys are hitting on. Um, I love this idea. We'll start with Blair and then, um, and then however you guys want to elaborate on it, this idea of it's just not me. It's not about me. It's about that relationship and about um, some acting coaches put it like, you go in to give a gift in the audition room. Your job as an actor is to bring something like you said, something there that they choose yes or no about. So can you elaborate more of just Maybe it's patience, maybe it's, it's a lot of times I know talking with casting directors on panels, they're nervous about actors just always pitching themselves versus just having a genuine conversation about two human beings in life and about the dogs or about kids or about things like that. Can you guys speak to more about what does it mean to you guys in your world for actors and business people to build authentic relationships? Can you want to start there, Blair? Yeah, yeah. In, in my experience, when, when we first get into this business and you come out of school or you get to New York or LA or wherever, everyone wants to know about auditions. Where do I get auditions and how do I see myself for auditions and I want to get the audition, uh, which is ultimately a sales thing, which is I want to go in front of somebody I don't know and they don't know me and I want them to hire me and give me money. And, it's, and that's a very bizarre thing because in no other business would you ever walk up and say, hi, I'm a stranger and let's you know, hire me and let's go. There's, there's, an, there's an interview process. There's, there's a, a building of a relationship there. Uh, and it happens in regular marketing. You know, that's why, uh, in marketing, it's called the rule of seven, right? It's, it's why there are at least seven, in the, the rule states there are at least seven impressions uh, of an item before a buyer will consider making a purchase decision. Now, traditionally, it's the rule of seven. I think these days, and you know, with all the noise, it's more like the rule of 35. But it's why you have the bus ads and the radio ads and the TV ads and the internet ads and then another bus ad and then uh, the, the magazine ad and then the billboard. The point of all that is for, not f for you to stop immediately and like jump out of your car and run to the store and buy that item. The idea is to build a relationship with that item so eventually down the road when you're standing in front of you know, the drink aisle in 7-Eleven, you go, oh yeah, there's that thing that I've been thinking about. Maybe I should give that a try. Building that relationship is an investment of time and I think so many actors go into this so focused on sales, they go into a room and they're like, if I just do it right, then I get the job and I will make the sale. And inherent in that thought is a very strange hierarchy. It's you are the casting director, you are the established professional, I'm the wannabe. And that's a really hard place to be. You know, that's again, you are the mystical gatekeeper and, uh, and I'm the wannabe and please let me in. It can't be that. It has to be peer to peer. It has to be storyteller to storyteller. So when you start marketing yourself as a storyteller who tells a particular story and you can apply that to any script, then you're able to go into a room and look at a casting director as a peer, as a storyteller. Remember, casting director's job is not to hire you. That's not what they do. Casting director's job is to parade about five of us in front of their boss, who is the director or the producer, and say, look, I vouch for all five of these people. I promise you, I stake my job on the fact that all five of these people can do the, can do the role, can tell the story. They all tell it a little bit differently, so you pick the one that best fits the story in your head. So the casting director is on the line when they, when they bring us in. And so you know the, the thought of going into a stranger and saying, hey, give me a job, casting director is gonna say, why? Why you? I've got 100 other people that I've invested time to get to know, that I trust, who can make me look good in front of my boss. So, so not worrying so much about always trying to book the job and not worrying about the, uh, looking at the casting director as someone who can give you this gift. But going in and saying, no, 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 look, this is a long-term thing and I have something to offer. And maybe I can help you with your boss, maybe you can help me, and if it's not now, it'll be in the future, that's okay. And it takes away some of the desperation. I think it takes away some of that neediness, you know, that actors have. I, one of the best lessons I think I ever had back in New York, I uh, was friends with James Clary, who now has his own casting office in New York, but at the time was a casting director for Playwrights Horizons. And he had to do the equity mandatory calls. Every six months, they need to do these. And, and he said, we we're in the theater company together. And he said, listen, uh, if you want to learn, come with me. Have a yellow legal pad, sit next to me, look like you work for me, <laughs> and just watch. Just watch and learn. And I watched hours of auditions of monologues. And I, I, I learned a lot. Um, don't bring props. 
Uh, but um, I think the biggest lesson, the biggest lesson I learned was the subtle difference between the person who came in technically perfect, but trying to impress. Who, at the, they took one step on the stage and you could tell. Everything was choreographed, everything was planned, everything was geared towards trying to impress the casting director. Versus the actor who walked out on stage and whose attitude, clothes, demeanor, posture, everything, said, hey, thanks so much for this opportunity. Let me show you what I do. Here you go. And thanks so much. The, the difference is incredible. Uh, you know, there are people who were dressed perfectly for the part, and there's other people who didn't, maybe they, they didn't have time to change because they were coming from another audition. Eh, but you know what? I can still tell my story if I'm wearing a different shirt. That's okay. So, so not looking at the casting director as it, it, getting rid of the hierarchy, looking peer to peer, realizing we both have jobs, we're both professionals in this town. Uh, I think it'll make a fundamental change both to what you do in the room, but it also will affect your marketing. Because when you start reaching out to them, you're not apologizing for yourself. Right. You're not making excuses. You're not looking for the gimmicks. I'm not gonna put glitter in the envelope so they remember me, you know. <laughs> you're not, you get rid of that because you no longer are trying to jump out of the bushes and say, hey, look at me. What you're saying is, no, I, I have value in this town. I'm aware of your career, you should be aware of mine. And, and let's talk. I think that goes back to your point. <laughs> you can clap that out, you can clap that out, yeah. Thank you. I think that goes back to your point of, you know, reading and being educated and having uh, many stories in your head that you're aware of that you can tell because it's engaging authentically with someone as a human being, you know. And um, I find there are people that I quite like and the only reason they contact me is because they want something because they know I can get a free thing or they can introduce them and it starts bumming me out because we start, you know, they're like, I, I, what about coffee once in a while, you know, and, and one of the like ground floor ideas of networking is, you know, come in with information that's useful to them and, you know, so to your point about having interesting content and a newsletter, stuff like that. So you're not always asking for something. You don't always have this ticket in your hand for like, it's because it's, it, it's not only tiring, but you start avoiding the person because you yep. just like, and, and it, you know, from a personal level, you just start thinking this person doesn't see, even see you, you know, you're just a dancing dollar sign or free right. thing, you know, and yeah. it bums you out. Yeah. So. You know, I was thinking about this just last week and I think that you guys have, like, it's easy to get the wrong mindset. So a lot of actors think it goes like this. Let's see, I'm gonna try to be clever. Representation, right? And once I have representation, then I can build my resume. Once I build my resume, then I'm gonna have the reputation I need to have relationships. I want you to just turn that around, right? Relationships first, a side effect of strong relationships is your reputation. A side effect, you guys, of a great repu uh, reputation is offers. So your resume can't grow any longer than your reputation is growing and that depends on your relationships. And then representation comes and you, and you just, it's like. I think that's brilliant, that's great. Thank it's you, excellent. I'm gonna coin that. That's, yeah. <laughs> I, I want the t-shirt, I want the t-shirt. Yeah. Um, so now you don't have to worry about representation, you don't have to worry about, we're talking about pilot season, forget about pilot season. Spend 2014 building relationships. Make a list of five people who tell the story you want to tell and make it your intention to add value to those people on a consistent basis and watch the fun results that come from that. And the cool thing is you're going to feel so good in the process that when the results come, they're not actually going to make you feel any better because you already feel the way you want to feel. One of my favorite moments ever in L.A. as an actor, one of my favorite actor memories is uh, when, when I first got to town, I met the casting director, the associate casting director for the practice. And I got my first gig in L.A., one line on the practice uh, uh, as a lawyer. Surprise, surprise. And, uh, and, 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 uh, and she and I have stayed in touch, obviously, because uh, this story, and it doesn't have to be a lawyer, but this sort of this world where, you know, I, I tend to do the, a lot of white collar professionals, you know, and, and in, the, in, the, in the professional world. Um, she has worked on a lot of shows that kind of deal in that universe and so we've stayed in touch and I have followed her career as she's followed mine and uh, there was this great moment I was on the Warner Brothers lot I had just finished reading for one show and I was walking back uh, you have to walk over you know and then across the bridge back to the the parking lot there uh, and she went zooming by in a golf cart and I knew from following her career 
that she and her partner, her partner had left to become a coach, so she was now the boss of this casting shop that was on the Warner Brothers lot that was doing a big show, and I knew her when she was back an associate. So, you know, the car went by, or the golf cart went by, and I just waved and said, congratulations, big boss now. And Ert, she stopped the car and said, can you believe it? Oh my God, I have my own shop. And they gave me a bungalow, it's over there. And, and, and it's amazing. And I said, I'm so happy for you, that's so exciting. What's it like working on the lot? She's like, oh my God, I come to work every day and there's all these people. And somewhere in the back of my head, I'm on the Warner, I'm thinking I'm on the Warner Brothers lot, just like shooting the bull with the casting director, just, you know, and it's not about, hey, can you give me a job or hey, can I come in? I'm, that is, it, it can't be about that. It is, I'm so happy for you and tell me about your job. And she said, what are you doing? I said, oh, I was over reading for a thing and, and it's so good to see you. And, and I had this moment like, yeah, this is what it's about. This, this is being an actor in LA, this moment here. You know, not, not doing my dance for somebody I don't know, hoping they bring me in. It's, it's, it's building those relationships and just, being aware of what she was doing, following her career, had led to that moment. Um, but that's a, that's a time investment, you know. Um, I, I got a job uh, well, about six months ago on a show where I first met the casting director in New York. She brought me in to read, nothing happened. A year later, she brought me in to read again, nothing happened. I moved to L.A. Found out a couple years later, she moved to L.A. I got in touch with her and said, hey, we're both in L.A., we'd love to see you again, nothing, nothing, nothing. Finally, she called me in 14 years after we had met. I hadn't seen her since. I walk in the door. Uh, I said, hi, Carol. She goes, oh, my God, we're both old. Look at us. <laughs> Look at us. How did this happen? And, and, and I said, yeah, well, it's been a while. And how are you? And she said, great. I live in L.A. And you, too. And I said, I know. We met when I was young and stupid and single in New York. And now I'm married and I got a kid and I live here. And she said, me, too. And we started talking about being storytellers living in L.A., having come from New York. And I'll tell you what, having that conversation before you audition because it wasn't an audition anymore. She, we talked and talked and talked, and she goes, oh, you know what, let's, let's play, let's do this. Right. That's what's going to change when you have a relationship. Yeah. I, I, I'll just quickly weigh in when you don't have that relationship, because more often than not, that's the situation. <laughs> and I'll put it on the perspective of being on the other side of the desk as a producer, as a hirer. Um, I gained this experience as a sales manager when I was selling advertising and then digital. And when you, anybody out here done hiring on their own or owned a business? Okay, a couple of hands. You probably know that when you are out looking to hire somebody, that person who comes through the door, you hope is the person you hire. You want it over, you want it done. So I thought it's an interesting attitude adjustment. I mean, I, I had a, a very quick story. I got a call for one line in Burbank and I lived in, uh, in Santa Monica on a Friday afternoon. Yeah, I'm annoyed. Why should I have to do this? I show up, five other guys have already signed in on the sign-in sheet. Now I'm doubly annoyed. Why? I, well, you're kidding. One line? Haven't I paid my dues? So I go in the room, and it's a TV job, and of course there are nine people on a couch paying no attention to me. And there's the casting person and the director. And he said, all right, Pat, you ready? And the line was something like, can I get your bag? <laughs> And said, uh, okay, yeah, uh, you ready? I said, I I I've got a question, though. <laughs> really? Yeah. I, I, I see this character as Pisces, maybe t <laughs> tubercular as a kid, maybe into jazz. Am I in the right direction here? Nobody laughed. <laughs> Clearly, I needed an attitude adjustment. <laughs> So fast forward, now I'm on this side of the desk, and, and the, the attitude should be, I believe, now is not all that panic that goes into the job uh, interview. Uh, it's a given you're prepared. It's a given you're right for the role, because that's why you're in there. All, all of these things are given. You know, how are you going to distinguish yourself among five, maybe 50, 100 other people? And I think you need to walk in through that door that this job is yours. I want to give you this job. I want you to be that person. I truly do. So not to put too much pressure on you, though, but really it's your job to sort of minimize the no's. But I think if you come in with an attitude of not this, this, this timid sort of, oh, I, I, I shouldn't even be here. I mean, you give a great example of, yeah, you, you've earned the right to be on the Warner Brother lot. You should be there. But take the attitude like, this is my job. Uh, clearly, they want, they want me in here. So it, it, it might be a quick attitude adjustment like that that may help you, because I think there are lots of different ways to prepare for an audition. Uh, 
tens of thousands of books out there and, and you find the way that works best for you. But I think if you, if you think about as that person who's doing the hiring, they really want you to be that person. They want to cast you in that job. So, anyway. Great. Um, it's the end of the year, so a lot of people are probably reflecting on, okay, how did my year go? What was the successes? What are the things maybe that didn't happen that I wanted to happen in the, my actor activity world, in my business? Um, and then they're thinking again now into 2014 of what can I adjust, what can I tweak, what goals can I make to make 2014 the year I wanted to be in my business? In the idea of goal making, in the, in the vein of marketing and business, what, um, and we'll go with Dallas here, what recommendations do you have us make? What are the things we should think about? What are the things in making goals? What can we control versus what we can't control in goal making? Do you want to take that? Sure. Um, for me, it's so much about the power of intention. It's like in, in your acting career, you're not in charge of the ac actually getting the job. You can do your best, but there's a lot of factors that you cannot control. But to set the intention, right? My intention is to book three co-star credits or better by the end of the year. Now you're gonna be operating on that level all year long. So whether you book the co-stars or you book a recurring or you book nothing, right? You're gonna be operating on that level. So whether or not you can control the outcome, I think it's really powerful to set your goals and make your goals public. So my personal rule is to never have more than three goals at a time. Otherwise, I'm too busy managing my goals and not actually moving toward them. So think about it. If it was December of 2014 and you and I are having a conversation and you are totally jazzed about the three concrete results you were able to generate, what would those results be? So you're looking at your resume and there are three new things on it. What do you want those to be? And then the flip side to that is, if you were really excited about three personal changes that you made or three experiences that you had or three relationships that you cultivated, what would those three things be? So now you've got professional goals balanced with inner goals. So aim, aim for the stars and then start taking uh, regular small actions. So it's like uh, think big, start small, move fast. So that looks like setting aside, you could do it in a couple of ways, setting aside 30 minutes a day devoted to career development or setting aside three actions, three actions a day moving toward your goals. You will be amazed at how much more quickly and easily you'll accomplish what you want and then some when you do less on a consistent basis. Rather than, this is why pilot season rubs me the wrong way, because you get this fever, right? It's like January, new year, pilot season, I gotta do something. So you spend January through March busting your ass and over-investing in workshops and doing these big old mailings and really spreading yourself thin and then April comes around and nothing's happened. So you decide to take a break and that break ends up lasting until September. And then you regret how long it lasted, so you try to make up for lost time by doing the whole thing again. And it's such a roller coaster that you can't c create sustainable success in that way. So think really big, but take measurable steps. And for me, it's three actions a day. If I'm taking three meaningful actions toward what matters most to me, the rest of the day can unfold exactly as it's going to unfold, but I know I've shown up for myself. Great. Anything you guys want to add to that, I think? Yeah, Great. Lance? Personally, you yeah. know, um, we cover a lot of ground in my job. And, you know, sometimes though it can be uh, very stressful. And I came at a a point in my career a few, about in September, but you know, about a year before that, my contract was going up and I have no control over whether these guys are gonna renew me or not, you know? And it's the same with when you're trying to get a job, when you're trying to book a job, you can't control these people. So I decided to start actively looking for another job and you know, how do you do that? I, to your point, I created goals find another job and um, yeah. and then my act because Check. and even if I didn't intend to leave and even if they you know plan to renew me it would at least you know have some leverage all that stuff so I um, I made myself do five things a day 
and even making that list of what those five things were going to be that day counted as one thing. So it was like, check, okay, I did that, you know, and like it might be, so, you know, and day, t day one was look at my LinkedIn account and see who I knew, who I could network with, who they knew. And then I just started really aggressively booking lunches. And it wasn't, the story wasn't about, I'm looking for a job. It's like, hey, how are you doing? What are you up to? You know, these are people I haven't seen. Because I didn't want to be that guy. Then it's like, hey, get out of here, you know, because you also don't want to seem, you know, because I wasn't unhappy. I was just really curious what was going on out there. But it ultimately it helped me because they did renew me and it helped me with my negotiations. But it also helped me appreciate where I was and what I was doing because I had a more informed view of the landscape out there. But above and beyond that, it gave me a sense of control because I, I like yeah. what you said about showing up for yourself because I showed up for myself. I did what I told myself to do and that's a good feeling. Like there's nothing worse than that shame spiral of like you're not, and if you mm -hmm. try to overbook yourself with too many things, you can start letting yourself down and then it's hard to recover from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, in, in January, the gyms overflow with new memberships. <laughs> <clears throat> pretty much you can get on any elliptical, elliptical machine in February because they've, they've all pretty much sort of given up. So I think the challenge for anybody, and it, it's one of the sort of selling principles that I've adopted and sort of talk about in, in this workshop that, that I give, it, it's work ethic. And I think it needs to be so intense and above and beyond what is the norm for most folks. In the business world, you're not measured on an annual basis. Ultimately, you are, but it's broken down on a quarterly basis. So in terms of goals, personal goals, life goals, I'm going to work out, I'm going to do this, I'm going to subscribe to these newsletters, I'm going to read these trades, I'm going to find, I think, five people, maybe five people you know, a week, and I'm going to look at the, I'm going to look at the uh, credits, end credits, and I'm going to find somebody who's a location person, and I'm going to find somebody who's this, and who do I, what, do I have something in common with those people? Because they're all potential people in your network, and you just never know who you get to meet through those folks. Yes, the gatekeepers are important. You're never going to go around a casting director, especially during uh, pilot season. Just not going to happen. But for you to build out your network by looking at people involved in post or, or in production. So expand your world that way. But you got, I think you need to set these goals on a quarterly basis, which is you know, 90 days. And they need to be realistic goals. Uh, if it's booking three jobs in 90 days, well, well that's a tall order. But, but make them tangible, because if they're so far out of reach, you, know, you don't go back to the gym you know, at the end of the month, because it's, it's just too hard. So compartmentalizing is important. I think articulating these goals is important. I think looking at it every 90 days and have you moved the pile mm -hmm. is important. I mean, th this is what business people do. That's, how, that's how, how you're measured. And we're all business people. We, we really are. And so, you know, if, if you haven't hit your goal after 90 days, were you, was it, um, was it overly aggressive? Or what do you need now to pick up the, uh, the pace for Q2? and Q3 and Q4, and then you sit back and, all right, it's the end of the year, what, what I've accomplished. But I think it needs to be, as you were saying, I think, I think they need to be small little things that you can manage and, and achieve to, you know, I'm gonna win an Academy Award. Okay, <laughs> excellent, you too, great. But um, that's what I would, I would say. So work ethic really needs to be, really needs to be cranked up. And that literally is doing something every day. And, and look, we're, we're, we're small business owners. That doesn't mean, what are you going to do this weekend? We work seven days a week, honestly, 24 hours a day. You're thinking about your career and your life and your job in the shower. And that's the life we've chosen. So, you know, we've got to kind of embrace that. I love the idea of taking concrete steps because I think it, it is a lot of work. There's a ton of work. And I think the difference between a professional actor and, and the wannabe is, is the person who realizes that this is a day-to-day -day job, that in, there's a lot of time, there's a lot of research, there's a lot of work invested. There, there was a great quote, I wish I could remember the specifics, but it talked about all the work we're talking about here, all the, the research and the marketing and the building relationships and knowing who we are and who the other players in town are. That's the work, that's what we do for a living. What we call work is a perk. You know, that, that, comes, that comes every now and, and, now and then. And, and investing this time, um, there's a lot to do. I mean, I, uh, I, I love research. Um, one, because I'm a dork. And two, because uh, I think, you know, I want to know 
about my business and I want to know about the players in the business. And uh, there are hundreds of casting directors and assistants and associates out there. And it is physically impossible for you to create a real first name basis, how you doing when you go by in the golf cart, working relationship with, with 1,200 people. You know, um, so figuring out you know, who in town tells the stories you do, building, you know, call it what you want, but building a target list. Um, I mean, if, I don't know if we're getting too specific, but, but you know, if, as far as taking, setting goals, building the target list. Who do I, who needs to know I exist? Uh, who needs me in town? Uh, and building that target list and then following their career and doing, doing the research. What are they doing now? Uh, what have they done? Because uh, you never know when those opportunities are going to come up. You know, whether or not they're on the, you see them on the golf cart on the lot and you can say congratulations on their new job. Or you can walk into an audition and say, hey, thanks so much for calling me. And by the way, by the way congratulations. I saw you guys picked up the new pilot. That's great. Leave it there. I've actually gotten auditions that way. You know, because it's, it's not just congratulations on the pilot, but the subtext there is congratulations on the pilot that lives in a universe that, that I work in. So, you know, uh, and, and you get, oh, yeah, thank you very much. And actually, you know, and a week later, I get, I get the call for that. Uh, and, and it's not just about that. It's, it's about, I think, being pro to pro and knowing what other people are doing. Hey, congratulations on, 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 your, on your audios. Congratulations on the new, on, on how many associates do you know who just got promoted to casting director? You know, and knowing, and I think for me, pilot season is a great opportunity. Casting directors are moving. People are changing jobs. What, who on your target list has moved? Where have they gone? What are they working on now? That stuff you have to know, stuff you have to track. And, um, you know, so setting those specific goals, who is on my target list, who am I gonna follow, what knowledge am I going to carry around with me so that I know who in town is doing what? I think that's important. There's a great song, uh, many great songs in Music Man, but one is you got to know the territory. Mm -hmm. And our territory is, is a pretty small group. I mean, it's not, it's not the universe, but our territory is, is definable. And you have to know who all the players are in your territory and who's buying what. And that's, as you said, that's an exhaustive amount of research. Uh, but that's what you have to manage. You have to be able to manage that information. I'm looking through questions um, here. Real I, quick while you're doing yeah. that, just um, what you just said, that amount of research is, is actually why, why uh, Casting About exists because I got dumped by an agency two weeks before Christmas. Uh, not that I'm bitter. And um, <laughs> no, I mean, it was a business decision. They went from 90 clients to 47 because they were going to focus on series regulars. And, that's, that's a business decision. I can't fault them for that, and I wasn't a series regular, so I get it, fine. But I had spent the previous year listening to them say, you know, welcome to the big leagues, this is a big step up from your other agency. You know, I went from downloading size to having scripts messengered to my house, like, it was cool. And they said, we'll take care of you, and I said, great. And I waited, and they said, we'll take care of you, and I waited. So a year later, I had to start over because the casting directors that I used to have relationships with, it was a year later. And I'm off the radar. So I went looking for them and I couldn't find them. And because they move around a lot. And, um, you know, it was like a mother of necessity thing. It was a very, very selfish, I, there are people in town, I want to know where they are and I need to find them. Um, and I went out for burritos with a guy who's now my business partner, who's a website internet genius guy. And I said, hey, so I think, there's this source of information that doesn't exist that I would like, what do you think? And one thing led to another, and that's, that was the idea of Brian Casting about, was presenting you know, that information so that you can track those down and, and find out because it's a lot of work, frankly. You know? I mean, you, you talk to anybody out there who's not maybe a double A list actor, and they're gonna say 85% of the work they get comes from their own efforts. So, I mean, that's, that's you doing the work. Um, Question from the audience is, how do you define a professional? What does a professional mean in this business to you guys? Smart blue suit. <laughs> um, this year, actually, in my Thriving Artist Circle program, our theme for the year was turning pro. So we've spent 12 months exploring this. And for me, if I could explain it in a nutshell, it would be showing up for yourself with a spirit of generosity. So something I say to new business owners a lot is that my heart is my container for my business. So if I'm open-hearted and generous, then I have a bigger capacity to hold opportunities. So I think a professional is someone who has a generous spirit and shows up for themselves. Was, was that a question based on, based on, on the amount of, of work somebody gets or how they approach the business? I think it's more from an approach of a little bit of what you're talking about and how you 
do the work, your work ethic, yeah. but it was just kind of okay. broadening that out to if there's any other ways you define professional. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 the generosity thing I love because it is about, I think, offering, and we've said it over and over again, it's offering what you have, so it's a two-way street. Being a professional is being part of a professional community. You know, my wife has her MBA, and in that business world, they go to these conventions, you know, and they meet each other, and they say, hey, I, my company makes widgets, and what do you do? We make gadgets. Oh, let's work together. Maybe we can help each other, and our widgets and gadgets could do something together. And I think, you know, in being part of this professional community is I'm a storyteller, you're a storyteller, and let's see if we can work together. It's not necessarily personal. You know, it's about the product, and it's about... You know, there are times that I've gone in and killed it in a room and they've gone another way because they want to tell a different story. So it's a bummer, but you can't take that personally. It's, it's being able to offer yourself fully and authentically. And that's a great thing too. If you walk into a room and you say, hey, look, here's my story. I hope you can use it. If you can authentically offer that story, you're giving you. Uh, you're not giving what you think they want. You know, you're not, you're not trying to impress them. You're giving you. Um, Eleanor Duzay, brilliant actress, had a great quote where she said, all I have to offer is a revelation of my soul. That's it, that's all I got. Which means, here's my story. And, and so presenting that and saying, I understand who I am, I understand what you're doing, it's not a personal thing, it's not a win the lottery, it's not, oh, I hope I get discovered and you know, suddenly I'm a big star. It's a long-term, here's what I have to offer a storytelling community. I think, to me, that's the difference between a, a, a wannabe and a pro who realizes that it's a long-term thing and that we're all in it together, the really generosity. Sometimes with pilot season, there's the adage of, oh, that's a chance maybe, hopefully, cross my fingers, I maybe become a series regular if I get that one lucky break, quote unquote. Um, how can we maybe reframe the conversation of how can we best, through relationships, take the next step, whether it's the first co-star or maybe that second co-star or a thing to go, okay, and this, um, this question comes from the idea of how can I best pursue the career that's in front of me versus the career that I think I can have if only I get the best blank. Does that make sense? What's the steps that maybe actors need to start thinking about and being honest of like, okay, my next step is this. How do they accept maybe here, I'm going to phrase it this way. How can they determine maybe their next career step? How do they figure that out? I'll give you a very uh, quick, quick story about my brother, Tim. Tim was in, a good buddy of his, had a pilot, and uh, they went in. And a gentleman who used to run NBC, who no longer did, said to Tim, I don't know, he's sort of been around. Tim went home that afternoon and wrote a spec script on uh, Seinfeld. Uh, he saw proverbial writing on the wall. And where at the level that he was at, you know, he, he needed to have these network executives respond differently, that he was the flavor of the month, not, eh, he's kind of been around. So he made a determination that he was doing a 90 degree. Uh, he's in the business, obviously, but he, he took stock of, of that experience. So just, just a short example, I think, of how you have to uh, keep your eyes open and look for opportunities, and, and is it, you have to act or you want to be in this business because it sure is fun hanging out with a lot of creative folks. And maybe you don't get to act, but maybe you get to do something else. In the, you know, how, how many casting folks started out as actors? How many uh, uh, t-shirts? Yeah, I'd rather direct and all these things. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I think uh, you don't want to necessarily lose sight of your gold, but I think you need to be fluid and realistic. Um, to me, that's being a professional as well, being nimble, being able to read the field and, and sort of find, find your way through the maze. So. Earlier, when you were talking about um, in, in your day-to-day -day business, when reaching out, um, especially if you're asking for money or financing, uh, building, building trust and building relationships so people trust you in what you're gonna do with their money. And I think that speaks a lot to the evolution of a career of an actor because it's not just about, you know, sure, we all want a job, but again, Casting director's job is not to hire us, it's to impress their boss, the producer or director. So for me, I look at it in stages of, of, of trust. How, how, much of, how much of a product, how much of a story can I be trusted with? So if a casting director, you know, at first it's gonna happen where a casting director is gonna get to know you as somebody who shows up on time, is a professional, comes in the room, tells the story, says thank you, and leaves. And that story could be the one line. 
you know, but if you come in and do it authentically and leave, at first it may be no more than they look right, they show up on time, they, they didn't screw around, they, they, they said it authentically and they left. So that's great, I need that because we're under the gun and we have a problem star and I just need someone to show up and hit their mark. And if you start to build that trust, you're gonna get called back by that casting director several times. And 90% of the work that I get is from casting directors who have already hired me on something else because they know me, they trust me, and they don't have time. And part of what I've learned at, at breakdowns, sort of peeking behind the curtain, is the volume of submissions and the numbers. We all know it's ridiculous, but when you actually see how ridiculous it is, I mean, I've seen what 2,300 submissions for a one-line role looks like. You know, one line, and 2,300 submissions that came in in two hours, by the way. Um, and I've seen casting directors who have to go through and pick 20 people to bring in because an actor every six minutes or every 10 minutes, six actors an hour, that's all they have time for. Physically, that's it. They can bring in no more. So they're picking 20 out of 2,300. So who are they picking? They're picking the people they know. They're going through submissions and going, I don't have time. Who do, oh, good, I know him, thank God. And I know him, that's two. And I know him, that's three. Because they're in a hurry, because they need people they trust, because they have, especially in television, they may have eight roles to cast for this show, six roles for the other show, 12 roles for the other show, and the producers want to see callbacks day after tomorrow. So they're going with people they trust. Now, once you're on the set and they do trust you, now maybe they're thinking, well, you know, Blair's done a couple co-stars for me. He's always, he's always pulled his weight. Uh, I would love to give him something more. I would love to give him that opportunity. And, and you're gonna start to grow and when you prove that you can do that and when you show up and now you're a guest star and you're there every week and you're a pro and you're fitting in with the rest of the cast, you have said, look, I, I've shown you I'm a pro and they are, then more likely to offer you more. And that trust and that networking is gonna grow because that casting director is gonna to talk to another casting director and they're gonna say, I really need somebody, who do you know? You know, uh, ultimately I think the goal is, what I call is getting on the uh, casting director's short list. Like, frankly, I wanna be the person they think of when they first read the script, even before the breakdown comes out. You know, um, and, uh, and then maybe, maybe get the call. It's happened, happened once for me where I got the call, my agent called and said, hey, um, Ghost Whisper just called. They did a rewrite. There's a new part that starts shooting tomorrow morning. Can you do Liz a favor and run over to Warner Brothers right now? First of all, I love the terminology. Can you do her a favor? <laughs> and and uh, so, yes, I can. Uh, and, and I got over to Warner Brothers and there were three of us there because it was, who do I know? Because there's no time for a breakdown. Who do I know? Who do I trust? Because the director, when we got there, she said, thank you guys so much. Okay, the director's in that room, so let me give you a few minutes, and this is what we're gonna do, and then I'll take you in one by one. So her job's on the line, and we're now operating together, and, and so building that trust is gonna open doors where the casting director is gonna look at you as a partner and say, hey, let's go tell bigger stories together, let's move on. You know, which is why I think we've all talked about this idea of the pilot season where, you know, when I first started and I was in New York, man, I knew every, every year, I knew people like, I booked my plane ticket, I'm going to LA for pilot season. Who do you know? Well, I, I don't know, it's pilot season. They give out TV shows, don't they, over there? I think they just hand them out. I think so. You know, but, but showing up as a nobody and saying, hey, I want to, you know, not only get a part, but I want to carry your show. I want to be the guy that you market your show by putting my face in a magazine, it's, it's not gonna happen. You have to build that trust, you have to earn that along the way. There's a reason Woody Allen and Scorsese and Spielberg and David Russell keep going back to the well. They keep going to the folks that they know and trust. And uh, there's an opportunity for all of us to break into that inner circle. It just may not happen overnight, but it is a process. But you, you do, I mean, when we did a movie, um, the casting director, uh, I said, should we, put a, uh, should we put this out in the breakdown? She said, really, you sure you wanna do that? <laughs> yeah, let's do that. Well, we got four boxes of submissions. <laughs> and clearly, we weren't gonna go through any of those because she had her list. And so. I wanna just chime in here. You have control over this. Don't walk out of here thinking, oh my God, I can't penetrate the inner circle and now they're saying pilot season isn't even real. And No. <laughs> you. You have total control over this because you can control how often and how much you contribute.
That's totally up to you. And that's what we're talking about here. If it's really about building relationships, then, then you don't have to rely on magic anymore. It doesn't have to be a happy accident that somehow you got a lucky audition and lightning struck. No, it's about the value that you add and you're in control of that. So please walk out of here hearing that this is very good news for you. Rather than feeling like an outsider looking in, you can create your own inside. You know how to do that. There are casting directors out there who need you, need your story and desperately are praying that you walk in the door. Uh, now, figuring out who they are and what story that is, that's a different thing. But, but you're right, there, it, it, it's a very, it is an empowering thing to be able to walk in the room and say, this is what I do. And, and so nice to see you again and see you next time. You know, and not just hoping that, dear God, I hope I get a job. To reemphasize, I think, especially for actors who have less credits, to know that you are professional, available, and reliable is the first step in the door. And then as the people say, you book the room and they call you back because you didn't get the first time. Two, three, you heard the stories of actors sometimes going in 15 times for a show before they book it because they're reliable and they trust them and it's just a matter of time. But they would never have gotten the first audition without being someone that go, they're not a crazy actor. They're actually, you laugh because we all have stories. Um, I know a casting director who told me that uh, he's been trying for 10 years to find the right role for an actor he loves. Hasn't happened yet. Now, you know, that actor's thinking, oh, I never get called in by this guy. Mm. Well, the casting director is a big fan. He's just looking for the right thing. And sometimes the best thing that can happen is you can go in, tell your story, and don't get picked. Because you, you want the casting director to go, oh, crap, producers picked somebody else, and I, I'm pulling for this person. So what else can I find for them? That's what you want. Does that actor know that that casting director is on that search? Maybe not. Maybe that actor ought to find out that information <laughs> and reach out to that person and say, so what, what is that role that you keep looking for? And maybe create that role. And, Just yeah. saying. And um, to go back to this, and you, um, I love the terminology you're using, Blair, with story. I think um, people hear it called brand. I think type was around as a story. And Dallas is um, shaking her head, which is exactly, but it was great because this is what I want to talk about, is the idea of how do you frame that so it is something that is offered versus a thing that is a stamp that maybe feel like I am something that's placed upon me, but something that I am, comes from within. How do you, I, how, how, what's that conversation I love for you that guys? question. So I think that it's important to have a general understanding of how strangers see you. Okay, but the problem with this conversation about actor branding or knowing your type is that it, it assumes that you don't know the people that you're going in to read for, right? Because if I, if I don't know you, then I better be able to tell right away that you're a tough cop, right? And now you get to be a tough cop and you're gonna play your tough cop roles and that's all you do. That's not why you're an actor. So yeah, have a general idea of how people see you, but it is not about your brand, it's about your relationships. So focus on the experience that you create for people. So Blair calls it a story. I like to think of it as an experience. How do you want your audience to feel when they see you perform? How do you want your collaborators to feel when, when they see you on the call sheet and they know they get to work with you that day? That experience then bleeds into your marketing and people, when they trust you, they see what you can do. So you don't have to limit yourself to these caricatures. So a caricature is great if you want co-stars, right? There's a time and a place to know that you can play the waitress. But man, if you want a career, you have to share your experience. So I, get, I just really have a, issues with this idea of actor branding because it's one dimensional and it doesn't go deep enough. I encourage you to go a lot deeper than thinking of your type. Instead, think of the experience that you create and convey that for people. That's how you build trust and that's where a relationship comes from. I 100% agree, I, and that's why story resonated with me, because yeah. branding and type and image did feel like a stamp. It felt there is a difference between what story you tell and what costume you wear, mm -hmm. okay? And it's very different. And, and this is a weird and this is a weird thing. I'm fascinated by it, and I've been sort of like trying to do more research, because Dal, uh, you're 100% right. It, it's, it's, it's deep and it's subtle, and it's not something you can just put on the right costume and you're it. It goes deeper than that. Right? It's experiential, right? It's experiential. Okay, for, for what it's worth, when, uh, when I first heard a casting director use this term story, and it was actually a seminar where she said, I know, branding, type, image, whatever, I just, for me, it's what story do you tell 
more than anything else. What story is in your DNA? And there were some people in the audience who bristled at that because they said, well, are you saying story? She said, yeah, story, singular. And they said, well, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to be that pigeonhole. We're actors. Come on, don't, you know, I, there's more that I can do. And her explanation I thought was fascinating. And whether or not you agree or disagree, I, I just thought it was fascinating to look at. She gave an example. And she said, okay, let's talk about this idea of story. So I want to talk about Kathy Bates. Okay, she's a brilliant actress, Oscar-winning actress, has done a ton of things, can do anything. She said, Kathy Bates, in my opinion, tells the exact same story in everything she does. Her terminology, and whether or not you agree with it, she said, in everything Kathy Bates does, she is the reluctant nurse. And then she gave a bunch of examples where actually Harry's Law, the story that she just, or the series that she just finished now, is, is about an attorney who quits and says, I'm not an attorney anymore, that's it. And then every episode, somebody says, please, please, please be my attorney. And she said, okay, fine, I'll be your attorney. I'll help you out, fine. Uh, before that, she was recurring on The Office, uh, a guest uh, on The Office as the CEO of the company that bought Dunder Mifflin. And her role was every now and then she had to fly to Scranton to bail them out of some problem. I don't want to be here. I'd rather be in Florida, but I came here to fix the problem. I'm going to help you, and then I'm going to leave. Fine. Um, or even Primary Colors, you know, where I'm a political consultant. I'm retired. I don't do that anymore. Okay, fine. I'll help you run your career. I'll help you run your campaign. Or Misery. I don't want to have to take care of you, but now I'm going to have to. <laughs> You know, it's similar, but, but the point there was, it's not that Kathy Bates is one dimensional. It's that Kathy Bates has a point of view. Kathy Bates has a world view. Kathy Bates has her experience mm -hmm. that she brings to any script. So if you take the same script and you give it to Kathy Bates and you give the same script to Meryl Streep, two brilliant actresses, you will get back two different stories because of who they are. And so it's not about a simple stamp brand. It's not about a costume. It's about an experience. It's about the way you look at the world. It's about everything about you that you bring to a script. There's going to be a flavor that you bring to a script that nobody else can bring. So call it whatever you want to call it. But knowing what you bring to a script, knowing what you have to offer, that's what you're going to have to market. That's going to be what people are going to respond to. That's how you're going to build a relationship at least in my opinion. Lance, can you, t um, I'm curious in the conversations you have with companies because they have, to, they have to say, okay, we're Diet Pepsi, how are we different? What's our unique, what conversations do you guys have around about how do we create the customer to have that feeling and what's the feeling and what kind of conversations do you guys have around those type of things? I, I mean, you know, we do a lot of branding with our films by the association that we have with the other brands. And so it's finding the commonality between the two and sometimes we, in film marketing, we have a really short time to tell the story of the story. You know, we, and with your, you know, role of seven and all that, you know, we, we, you have to really saturate the media to do it right, or you can have a partner help you. And so, you know, something like a, a Pepsi or a McDonald's, you know, would go really well with a kid's film. And we find the commonality for, for them and do our pitch. But for us, it's, it's creating a different story for the consumer. When they look at that association, this is, must be a big family-friendly film. Because if you've got a McDonald's kid's meal, that's telling you something. If, you know, you've got a film where there's a Barney's tie-in with a window, you know, this is going to be for a sophisticated audience. It's probably a little quirky. You know, there's something special about it. It's, it's different than maybe if you do something with Macy's, then it's females 18 to 49 you know and it's it's that's this film's for me you know I'm shopping I'm look at this I'm a lady it's it's right in my wheelhouse so you know we there's there's shorthand that we create in marketing by association you know but it's understanding who we are as a film what what that film is saying and then really being educated about what's in the marketplace and what will resonate with the brand because they all get hit up you know everybody who spends over $20 million a year on marketing gets hit up by the movies by everybody, you know, because partnership, even partnership marketing within brands is really expanding, you know, and it started off with like the Jeep and the Eddie Bauer, you know, and, and now it's, because that tells you something about Jeep. It's outdoorsy, you know, we get it, you know, you tour together. And, you know, we're seeing, <laughs> we're seeing more and more of that, you know, if, even with like uh, United and Weston and the Heavenly Bed. And because it becomes again, you know, you've got this lovely comforter and it's telling you a shorthand that you're, in the right place with United. We care about your comfort in the same way that Weston has for the past 20 years. And so, you know, when we talk about all of this, like being a professional, understanding who you are, your brand, the career that you want to have, 
it, it comes back to, again, you know, to all of your, what story you're going to tell. How are you positioning yourself? How are you authentically positioning yourself? How are you put, what are you putting across? What are other people seeing? You know, because you can change the message. You can, you know, as you were saying, you do have control over it. You do have control over how, how you're being perceived, but you need to start with the self-assessment and being authentic to yourself, first of all. Lance, can I ask you, because I'd be curious to know um, what you're talking about now is, is sort of the marketing of a finished product, the mm -hmm. film, with uh, either distributors or marketing or branding partners. But I would imagine, if you're backing up in the process, and I'd be curious to see what you think, it seems to me that even before that, there is a certain marketing that goes on between the Weinstein Company itself and properties that maybe they acquire, you know, at Sundance, you're shopping or you're dealing with producers, writers, directors. Um, cause in my opinion, you know, the Weinstein has uh, has its own, like, I, there are certain stories that feel Weinstein. Right. My, how much do you deal with that in-house? How much are you aware of, like, what the w Weinstein brand means and the stories you tell when you are talking to other filmmakers? Well, I mean, we have a track record of over 300, I think it's 320 Academy nominations and 70, 78 wins. So, I... I mean, that's, that's it. So that's pretty who good, we are. is what you're saying. Right. And yeah. in the past uh, five years, we've won something like 30% of the Academy Awards, mm -hmm. which is, you know, we're small but mighty. And that's how we, and Harvey has an incredible eye as an editor. He's got amazing taste. He's passionate. He's in it every minute of the day. You know, he's not phoning it in. This is like his greatest love is doing this, and it shows. And I think that's the messaging. You know, people who are aware of us, if you're, if you've got the next Spider-Man movie, it may or may not be like the right fit for the Weinstein Company. Maybe you know, because I'd love to see Harvey do a Spider-Man film, because um, it would be excellent. You know, it would be great. You know, directed by Quentin Tarantino, it would be. So, who doesn't want to see that? So, um, you know, I, and I think that we do. We definitely have a very clearly defined brand where it's elegant, it's high end, it's sophisticated, it's thoughtful. It's their cultural icons, you know, The English Patient, um, The Crying Game, you know, Cinema Paradiso, it just we can go on and on of like the Miramax days, all, you know, all of the Tarantino films. You know, there is definitely a, a brand. And so when filmmakers meet with Harvey, he's the real deal. He's, he's going to work and not sleep and make this film successful. And so filmmakers who are really about the story and about getting their story out there, really look to Harvey, and and you know that's he goes shopping a lot in film festivals, and you're meeting with Harvey Weinstein. It's it's uh, it's a good thing. So. Can I ask a quick question? What percentage of uh, the films you do are acquisition versus development? It, it varies year by year. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let me put that another way. Okay. No. Okay. Um, there's, I want to acknowledge a couple questions we're not going to get to tonight about Twitter and Facebook and things. We're actually going to have separate panels on those things, so hold on to those, come back. We're um, shaping those for 2014. Um, those are some more specific questions that we're just not going to have time for tonight, but they're going to happen, I promise. We're working on them as we speak. So with that said, um, before we wrap up, I just want to, um, we'll start um, with Dallas and go down this way. Maybe um, you shared so much. Great information, a lot of um, big picture thinking. What's maybe one nugget that you can um, leave the audience with to kind of help maybe reshape, rethink, encourage for, for the next year? Stop chasing auditions and start building relationships. I sound a little bit like a broken record, but how liberating. Imagine going into 2014 saying, I don't audition, what are you talking about? right? I don't need auditions because I build relationships. And then the second, so, and I feel like that can kind of be abstract. So let me give you some tangibles. How do you build those relationships? Consistently reaching out. So you've got options. Twitter and Facebook, if your target list is using that, okay? 80% of what you're sharing is a personal connection. Only 20 is self-promotion. If you can't, don't have online access, traditional mailings still work. So that's a monthly mailing, updating them on your career and adding value. And then, of course, that lead capture on your website and all that other fancy stuff. But it's not rocket science. It's about being consistent. I, it's a tough industry. It's tough in every aspect of the industry. You're all competing for a very tiny spot to be successful, you know, in number one movie, you know, top-rated show, et cetera, great role. 
I think it's important to be kind to yourself and to love yourself and to value yourself. I think it's really important because if you're not, no one else is going to be. You've got to value yourself. You've got to be respectful and give yourself a break sometimes. If it's not going well, don't beat yourself up over it. Take a day. You know, sometimes I wake up and I think, okay, this week is terrible. And, and so I give myself the speech. If all right, if you show up and do these following things, you can take Friday off. And it's like, really, I can take Friday? And it's like I'm driving, like just having this conversation with myself. And it makes me so happy, though. I get to take Friday off. And then when I walk in and like Thursday is my Friday, it's it's sad. But it's like these small things make me happy. But you need to take care of yourself, you know, and it's, it's the most important thing because otherwise you'll get demoralized. I think following up on that, it, it is very, very, very difficult to stay upbeat and focused. And the cell cycle for something in, in this world, I mean, I, I had lunch with a guy who bought the book rights to Catch Me If You Can. And he told me it was 15 years from the time he purchased the book rights until that film was made. I don't have that time, personally. Um, but it's, it's a long, long, long process. And to be able to stay focused and energized and upbeat and positive, it, it really is a real challenge. So I think that the trick is to, to dress for success and to um, just plan on showing up every day in, in some form or fashion. And if you find that you've done everything right, I think you know, it, it's OK to sort of be nimble. And if there are new opportunities that, uh, uh, that present themselves and you're still involved in this great fun, creative business and dealing with great, fun, creative people, then, then maybe that's what you need to do. Do what you can to lose the hierarchy. Get rid of the idea that there are established pros who are gatekeepers and you're some wannabe just trying to break in. Get rid of it. Think of yourself as what you are. You are a freelance storyteller in a town of freelance storytellers. And whether it's casting directors or directors or writers or producers or actors, we all are coming together to tell a story and then we disperse and make new groups and tell new stories and disperse and make new groups and tell new stories. You have a voice in that storytelling process. So take the time to realize what that voice is. What experience do you bring to a script? What story do you bring? Find the people in town who are telling the same stories and focus all your energy on those people. And focus all your energy on those people, not to ask them, can you please give me work? But to say, hey, we seem to be doing the same thing. So maybe we can work together. I can offer you my story. You can offer me yours. We'll work together and build our careers as, as we go. It's going to change what you do in the room. It's going to change your marketing message. It's going to empower you on a daily, instead of waiting around, waiting for the opportunity to go hopefully impress somebody. It, it's not. It's, it's you taking the action to find the people who need you and want you and who would be lucky to be working with you and to find value in your individual stories. Um, and once you find those people, stay in touch, build a career together. And, uh, and that, that's, that's the difference between the people who flame out after a year and the people who are here for decades, being a storyteller. Let's give them a hand and say thank you. I personally want to thank you too. I know how busy all of you are for being here. It's the holidays, which means a lot to us. Um, thank you for viewing. Again, please, um, surveys, just leave them on the table on the right. Um, and thank you again for coming. Have a wonderful, happy holidays and new Thanks year. Thanks very much. Thank you.